Another key concept from integral theory can perhaps resolve the well-known dispute between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, where they couldn't even agree on the nature of truth. Wilbur describes how reality can be viewed most accurately as four quadrants, or four different lenses – interior and exterior, individual and collective. The quadrants are equally valid but distinct. Each has its own rules for gathering knowledge and truths that apply only to the segment of reality it's focused on. From this perspective, Harris was insisting on a scientific, objective definition of truth, while Peterson was more interested in a cultural definition, truth as culturally agreed and transmitted through myth and story. For Integral, both are right, but incomplete. Famously, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris had these major debates, some probably the most high-profile debates between atheism and religious belief. And a lot of people said they were really fascinating conversations, but on, in some sense, it sounded like they were talking past each other. And I know you have this concept of different forms of truth and the different quadrants of truth. Could you briefly explain, do you think that helps to explain what was going on? Yeah. And if so, how? Sure. Um, we talked about the good, the true, and the beautiful. We talked about Immanuel Kant's three critiques. We talked about Jürgen, Jürgen Orbermas's three validity claims. And said that those three are um, a, uh, <clears throat> a condensed version of four quadrants. And what they really amount to is that the four quadrants means that you can look at any happening from at, at, in at least two major ways. You can look at it from the inside or from the outside, from a subjective view or from an objective view. And you can look at it as an individual, a singular event, or a plural event. So every individual uh, human, for example, exists in a series of collectives. And so if you put those together, you get four quadrants. You get the inside and the outside of an individual and a collective. And all three of those are very real perspectives they show very real dimensions. And those dimensions do turn out to be the foundation of those other items that I was mentioning. I had previously mentioned first, second, and third person perspective. So the <clears throat> first person perspective, defined as the person who is speaking, that's an I, or we, or me, mine. Um, that's the in interior of an individual, what we call the upper left quadrant. So that's an I space, and it would be um, Jürgen Abermas's validity claim, for example, of truthfulness. Or it would also be the beauty in the eye of the beholder. Um, or any of the subjective beliefs that you happen to have and that are true, existing truths for you. Those exist together and collectives. And so those aren't just subjective, they're intersubjective. And they involve not just me being aware of me, but me also being aware of you, for example. So second person is defined as the person being spoken to. So in this case, you're second person, I'm talking, so I'm first person. And the goal of our dialogue is some sort of mutual discussion where your subjective space and my subjective space will resonate together closely enough that I can say, I think I understand what you say. I understand what you mean. And you can look at me and say, yeah, I think I understand what you mean. So we have a kind of mutual understanding. That has to do not with individual truthfulness or individual aesthetics or beauty. It doesn't have to do with objective truth either. It has to do with intersubjective values, intersubjective goodness, ethics, how we treat each other as individual subjects. Would, th would that be more Jordan Peterson than relative to Sam Harris? Yes, yes. They do tend to emphasize different quadrants, where Sam, even though he'll say things like, uh, consciousness is real, uh, consciousness is the only thing that can't be doubted, 
Um, you can look at consciousness in a kind of objective way, and there are subjective truths, that kind of stuff. He still has a tendency to interpret what that means from a third-person deterministic fashion. So he'll say things like, using Charles Whitmore, the guy that got in the Texas Tower and shot up a bunch of people. Um, he told his prison jailers that when he died, do an autopsy, because something was wrong with his brain. And they did found a tumor. And so Sam will say, okay, that's when we really understand everything about neurophysiology, we'll understand all of evil behavior, just like this tumor is causing Whitmore to do that. But just the problem with that is it's just too extremist a version of it. Because even if the tumor tended you towards really antisocial behavior, it didn't say get in this particular tower at this particular time using this particular gun, shoot exactly these many people, cause exactly these many deaths. But that's a deterministic mechanism that he demands in order to interpret what's arising. And again, that's just you have two fundamental, unprovable choices about how you want to view this relative world as it's arising. And there either is the creative advance into novelty, or there isn't. And I find the creative advance into novelty much, much more reflective of the world as it is arising. And in terms of any sort of ultimate truth, that's where the waking up traditions simply come down and say, actually, you can't say anything about the relative world in, in an ultimate truth. Because all of our concepts make sense only in terms of their opposites. They pleasure, pain, good, bad, infinite, finite, up, down, in, out. So all of our concepts are based on opposites, but ultimate reality has no opposite. So we really can't conceptualize it. And the real genius of Mahayana Buddhism, a guy named Nagarjuna, basically came out, and his whole notion of emptiness is that you can't literally say anything about the relative world that will end up being absolutely true, because you'll always end up contradicting yourself. So he had a very, very sophisticated uh, dialectic that basically said, take any characteristic you want. It can be free will or it can be determinism. It can be consciousness, or it can be matter. It can be truth, or it can be falsity. And call that X, and then he demonstrates that, re that reality actually is neither X, nor non-X, nor both, nor neither. That nothing you can say about the world is ultimately correct, including what I just said, and including what I just said there, and that too. And the whole point of Nagarjuna and all of Mahayana Buddhism and virtually all the world's mystics agree is that in order to see this ultimate reality, you have to directly experience it. You have to actually awaken it yourself. And until that happens, everything you say about it is wrong because you're just not in touch with it. So you can say, well, it's God. It's not God. It's atheistic. It doesn't matter. You still don't know it. So everything you're saying is ultimately not right. And you keep doing that until you awaken the second mode of knowing that plugs you in to this direct first-person experience of a ground of all being. That's called enlightenment. That's called awakening, and so on. And that really is a mystery. Um, and that's why Nagarjuna called it emptiness. Um, he's, it can neither be called void nor not void, but in order to point it out, we call it the void. And the whole point of that is you keep doing these meditative practices until you awaken that mode of awareness. And then you have this direct experience. And it can neither be described as deterministic or free will, causal or free. And that's the ultimate state of a Buddhist or mystical orientation.
So when we get in those kinds of arguments, that's at least one thing worth keeping in mind. You can still give your relative arguments about which seems to work best in the relative realm. And that's why I say that a creative advance into novelty turns out to be probably the best way to describe that. And so even somebody like Daniel Dennett, who is often argued with Sam Harris, Dennett maintains that evolution does produce a degree of increasing degrees of freedom, or what he'll call evitability, as opposed to inevitability, which is determinism. And evolution produces degrees of freedom. And those are very real. And even Sam will say, I'm not even sure I can explain the difference between me and Daniel. Because he realizes if you actually push that deterministic position, it really gets into, into problems and doesn't work very well. Um, the um, whole notion of some degree of freedom, that in itself is very hard to describe adequately. Because as soon as you say what that free choice is, you can always come up with some, something that preceded it and it was outside of your control. And so you never really look like you have freedom. Um, but again, you can do the same thing to, to that opposite belief because you're both just, you're, you're arguing opposites in a world that ultimately is, is beyond opposites. But Mike Murphy quotes an evolutionary biologist who went back and looked at the evolutionary record and attempted to determine the number of genuine transformations that occurred in that evolutionary unfolding. And a transformation is defined as, as the introduction of an emergent quality. And emergent means new, means it never happened before, means that nothing like it happened before. It's radically novel. It's part of the creative advance in, into novelty. What's so interesting is that I don't know how this person came up with this, but the number of minor transformations in evolution was 600,000. The number of major transformations, and I don't know what the distinction was between that, but that was between 20 and 100. But the point is there's, a, there's newness emerging in this evolutionary stream. And that's how we went from just simple quarks to the sonnets of Shakespeare. The undeniable fact of that is that novelty is just all over the bloody place. And if you have strict determinism, you can't get that. It's not going to happen. And so you just have to end up making a choice. You, you just sort of stare at science and say, well, it looks like every event has a cause. Although then you run into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it says, no, it doesn't. It's actually probabilistic. So determinist, determinism is strictly shot right there anyway. Um, or you acknowledge that however this happens, there is a creative emergence of no novelty. And you're having thoughts right now that in part are emergent. They're a bit of newness that's never, ever, ever happened before. And even if we knew all of the factors in your brain and everything else is affecting you, and by the way, you're affected by a billion other factors, all of which have to be determined in order for that to happen. Even if we knew all of that, there's still a capacity that novelty is going to emerge in your case. It only happened 600,000 times in evolution. And even Sam Harris has at least six novel ideas before breakfast. And he acts that way. Um, so that kind of argument just sort of goes back and forth and back and forth. And you can get very bright people like Dennett arguing very similarly to Sam Harris. Like Sam says, he really can't tell the difference between him and Dennett. But Dennett argues for degrees of freedom, and Sam argues for not. Um, what happens with the Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson is how they come down on that side of this ultimate mystery of what's happening. And However much Sam acknowledges that ultimate unity consciousness and that subjectivity is real and all of that, 
he does tend to come down on the side of third person objective realism. And so if we could know all of brain neuro neurophysiology, at some point he explicitly says, then we would understand all of evil and presumably be able to fix that. And again, that's just pushing it way, way, way too far. And that's what Peterson won't do. He won't push it that far in that direction. So he's always coming up with these factors that have a different type of truth value. And we said earlier that there were um, a, a narrow version of truth, as in the good, the true, and the beautiful, and that was just sort of a narrow objective truth, but that all three of them could be considered different types of truth in the broad sense. And that's what Peterson is always acknowledging. And so I think one of the Weinstein brothers um, came up with the notion of metaphoric truth. Um, however we want to consider it, there are truths that don't come down to just third person, objective, exterior, realistic truths. And those are very, very real realities. And if nothing else, how we get to those is different from how we get to a mere objective understanding. So how we understand that atoms make up molecules is different in terms of how we understand what you and I should be doing. In both senses, there's an overall type of truthness to whatever we're saying. There's an isness to whatever we're saying. So even if my values arise in my awareness, if I'm aware of them, they have an isness. They exist. They're phenomenologically real. And so I can say, well, that's the isness. That's real. And then in same is true for the good, the true, the beautiful. They all have an isness factor. And that's what Sam focuses on. Because he'll just say, well, we're just navigating through this world and we just make choices, and these are better or worse, but there are things that are ultimately uh, true, and he focuses on the isness of that, and that's what we should, that's what we should go for. Um, and again, that's, that's fine, but the methods that you get to those isnesses, those are still different. And that's um, Harvard Moss's validity claims. It is the good, the true, and the beautiful. It is quadrants. And Sam is focusing on those right-hand exterior approaches. And Jordan acknowledges those, but he's always coming up with some very real left-hand how in terms of values. And I don't necessarily agree with all he says, but I absolutely agree with his addressing that dimension and that issue, because that is real, that is there, and that cannot be reduced to objective science. It's very interesting because Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris had a two-hour conversation where they couldn't agree about the definition of truth. I know, I know. And, and can, you, can you explain why they couldn't agree? Well, yeah, because they, they couldn't think, they're each talking from a different one of these uh, perspectives. Um, and the fact is, all four of those are correct. That's the whole point about an integral approach, is that everybody is right. And so, again, it's not who's right and who's wrong, it's how they all fit together. And these were two relatively good arguments being given for some very different truth perspectives. And they were both right. Um, and that's why there's, there's this kind of begrudging agreement. They'll both see the other person's argument and go, well, I, I can't really disagree with that, but here's the part that's not being included. And then they'll talk about their perspective truth and how it is different from this one. And so they're saying something that's not getting included in the other person's argument. And they'll go, yeah, okay. But then often the other side will say, well, I don't disagree with that. It's just, here's this other stuff that you're not including. And that's how it went, back and forth and back and forth. Um, and you see, in a sense, the same thing with Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris and their argument on free will. They agree on almost everything, in a certain sense, about neurophysiology. But one of them is arguing from a first-person perspective where 
one of the phenomenological realities that you have mostly is a type of, of free agency. You, you don't experience hard determinism, but somebody like Immanuel Kant, he wants to get you from a position that he considers unfree, which is heteronomy. In other words, you're other directed. Your thoughts aren't your own. You're a conformist. You're a part of the herd mentality. You're governed by other people's thoughts. And you can tell if that's happening. You don't have to wait way down the road when we understand all of neurophysiology and can explain all of evil behavior according to Sam Harris. Whether you know the, all of the functioning of neurophysiology, you do know if you're being a conformist or if you're doing what Kant wants you to do, which is to be not heteronomy, but autonomy. You're self-determining in the sense of you're creating your own thoughts, you're having your own viewpoints, you're not conformist, you're not other-determined. And the, one of the major forms of the free will determinism argument is that one version of determinism means just strictly hard determinism, and that means absolutely everything is determined. And again, Sam doesn't actually believe that, but he does tend to fall back on giving ex, um, examples from that type of thing um, and making those types of claims. Um, and so when he argues against free will, he's actually arguing, um, there's a fairly well-known um, philosopher, highly respected. His last name is pronounced differently, but it's spelled P-L-A-N-T-I-N-G-A. -A, Alvin Platinga, however you pronounce that. Um, and he points out that what Sam Harris is arguing against is what Alvin calls maximal autonomy. Um, and Alvin points out that, that almost none of the believers in free will believe that there's maximal autonomy. That just means you're radically free and have no constraints on you whatsoever. Um, almost everybody that believes in some sort of free will believes that there are constraints. And in the integral view, we have what's called a cosmic address, which is simply when you add up all of the various dimensions that a particular holon is at, what its quadrant is, what its level is, what its line is, what its state of consciousness is, what its type is, that gives you its sort of location in this manifest um, universe. And all of those constrain your activity right now. They're all determining it to some degree in that sense. But then there's also a degree of freedom within that. And that can't be reduced to just, just determinism. So. The idea of freedom is free agency, which is what Jordan Peterson and Dennett tend to argue, is that, um, to use Kant's version, even right now, even if we don't know all of neurophysiology, whether it's determined or not, we do know if we're being conformist or if we're acting more on our own wishes and desires. We can tell that right now. We know if we're doing that right now or not. And if we do become more autonomous, then we are freer from the constraints and demands of a herd mentality and a heteronomous existence, which is not a very creative, autonomous individual existence. And we can do that whether or not there's brain determinism or not. I mean, maybe my brain's totally determined right now. I can still make that choice. And the one is free and the other isn't free. So that's the type of free will arguments that most believers in free will argue. It's not what Sam tends to argue. He tends to argue this hard determinism thing with a maximal autonomy. Not very many people do that. Jordan Peterson's not doing that. And Daniel Dennett's not doing that. So what Sam is tending to do is fall back on these right-hand, exterior, third-person perspectives that do tend to look more deterministic, strictly deterministic. What Peterson is doing is arguing from these interior, 
subjective and intersubjective dimensions that are also very real and cannot be determined according to merely objective exterior realism categories. And so they really are, in that sense, even though they do find that if they kind of push into each other that they, there are some real sort of core agreements, um, they really are differentiating in large measure according to these different quadrants, these different perspectives that they are taking as most fundamentally real. They acknowledge the others, but they tend to, to really come back and emphasize those particular perspectives, especially when the other person isn't including them. And that tends to be the way the argument goes. Is Sam will argue that that's just not right, and then Jordan will say, well, that's just not right. Uh, and, and so they get into that kind of lockup, uh, even though they both sort of acknowledge the existence of all of them. Um, but one of the real fundamental differences is just that. They're coming from these different perspectives. Those different perspectives are real. And each different perspective shows a real dimension of reality. It really exists. It's really there. And you can't argue it away. And that's why they don't ever really give up on, uh, on the argument. I mean, if this is really just totally obvious, it wouldn't be a perennial, unsolvable philosophical question in the West, like the mind-body problem, and primary quality and the primary problem, all those. Those are really fundamental issues, in part because it does come down to that mystical notion that ultimately all of these concepts are based on opposites and ultimate reality isn't an opposite. So you're always going to get caught up in these kinds of arguments and you're never going to be able to argue them fully. The only way you're going to be able to know the real answer to any of that is to experience that pure ground. And then that will solve the issue for you in a direct and immediate sense.